the spring of 1971, on a busy Saturday afternoon, a successful store owner named Barbara Hulanicki dragged her husband out shopping. They came to a West London antiques market. While they were shopping, the unimaginable happened. A bomb exploded in their hip boutique, Bieber. The explosion ripped apart Bieber's stockroom, injuring a guard. The bombers were called the Angry Brigade, a radical underground group dedicated to destroying the establishment. They had already attacked politicians, judges, and even the Miss World contest. And now they settled on a different target, the shop girl. But why? The answer came in a written statement from the Angry Brigade in which they set out their rationale for the bombing. All the sales girls in the flash boutiques are made to dress the same and have the same makeup. In fashion, as in everything else, capitalism can only go backwards. They've nowhere to go. They're dead. And of course, it was grossly unfair to single out the shop girl for such a vicious attack. But it also shows just how prominent she'd become by the early 1970s. And I want to understand how that happened. How did the image of the shop girl transform so dramatically from suburban chain store worker of the interwar years to one with such a high public profile? This is the story of how shop girls grew in status in the second half of the 20th century, with some even becoming the new cool. It's the tale of shop girls turned war heroines. There were, we think, about 60 or 70 families living underneath Oxford Street during the war. Of boutique shop girls who embodied the brand. She took me to the office and they measured me and they said I was an absolutely perfect size. And the influence of Britain's most famous grocer's daughter, Margaret Thatcher. For the first 18 years of my life, I lived over the shop which my father owned and ran. shop girls were among the unsung heroines of the Second World War. For them, it became a patriotic duty to keep the country's stores up and running, even in the midst of the Blitz. As millions of people fled to the safety of the countryside, many brave shop workers carried on travelling into city centres like here on Oxford Street to open up shop. In doing so, they were sending out a strong signal. It was business as usual. Shop girls were the backbone of the city centre workforce. Here are some assistants in Bourne and Hollingsworth, a department store in London. I'll definitely have that one. Thank you, ma'am. Assistants like these all over the country were taught how to prepare for Hitler's attacks. They were trained in first aid, how to evacuate buildings and put out fires. Miss Smith arrives. She has received training from the local authorities, which you too can receive. Note how Miss Smith keeps as near the floor as possible and plays a jet of water on the heart of the fire to get it under control. Now the spray has done its work, the bomb is almost out. Miss Smith finishes off the job. This shows some shop girls undergoing their air raid precaution training. Uh, they're putting a fire out in, a, in an armchair in the middle of Wembley. This is, this is another group of shop girls. So it was something that was happening right the way across the country. And what's this one? That one... This one is much closer to home. This shows some of the staff. They'd been told that there was a threat of a gas attack, mm -hmm. so they'd had to put on their gas masks and go up onto the roof. Yeah. Gas masks and tin hats, all part of shop work? Absolutely. They've still got rather nice court shoes on underneath. Yes, well, I suppose you have to have a little bit of glamour as well as the uh, fetching headgear that you're expected to wear. You don't often think of shop work as war work. Why was it war work? What these women were doing was being expected to help out in ways that they'd never tried before. They might have been having to help 
with the shelters, perhaps provide the food or dress the beds or something like that. They might even have helped laying the sandbags around the outside of the shop. It really does change your view of women's war work, I think, to think that these are shop assistants. They're doing something very extraordinary. Some of them were putting in an additional six or eight hours after they put in a full day's work, so they were working extremely hard to make sure that everything stayed as normal as it possibly could. Did stores like John Lewis have their own air raid shelters? There were lots of air raid shelters around the Oxford Street, and there were rooms which could house up to 200 people. And sometimes even people who had been bombed out were allowed to stay there permanently. So there were, we think, about 60 or 70 families living underneath Oxford Street during the war. It was part of a shop girl's job to look after the homeless living in the basements of department stores. A job which could turn into a matter of life and death. As it did, the night John Lewis was attacked. This is a copy of the Gazette, which is the staff magazine for John Lewis. And it's a copy from 19th of October 1940, just about a month after the store was bombed. And in here, there's a fascinating letter written by Miss Catherine Austin, who was a member of staff at the time. And this is her on her retirement some years later. She's describing the terrible events of that night, the night of the bombing. I wasn't actually on the watch that Tuesday night. And instead, she was mothering the evacuees and had been for the previous 10 days. We were all, bar the watch, in bed by 10.45, but were awakened about 12 by the first direct hit. She panics, jumps out of bed. She's running along to a second room where people are sleeping to try and get them out. Just as I got there, the second bomb fell somewhere in front of me. I had one moment of sheer panic, just one moment. I could have sworn that the walls in front were going to collapse and that the ceiling would then come down on us all. And this is interesting. It says it was a curious feeling, a moment of calm. It was a curious feeling. It was not so much seen as felt, as though someone had put far too much into a cardboard hat box and you knew it must give way. However, the awful moment passed and I went on. It was tremendous. She manages to get them out of the building, onto Oxford Street. They go to a shelter, crunching on broken glass, shattered glass, down the street to Lillian Skinner's, the shoe shop, who very kindly opened their shelter, especially for us. Well, Catherine Austin showed true grit. She probably wouldn't have thought of herself as particularly heroic, but she was. And her calmness and her presence of mind that night saved lives. When dawn broke, Miss Austin was horrified at what she saw. Much of Oxford Street, including John Lewis, the shop she had worked in most of her life, was in ruins. This was the store the morning after it was bombed. Got some really powerful photographs here of John Lewis soon after the bombing. The building's still on fire, what's left of it anyway. You can see the firemen putting out the flames there. But just a few days, weeks later, the shop was up and running. Here are the guys from the warehouse, sorting through the fabrics, getting things back to the shop floor. Look at this damage in the background here. Shop girls brushing out fabrics, salvaging what they can, broken glass all around them. I love this one, smiling. Hair curled up, brushing down the gowns and the dresses, ready for the next night out. What really comes across in these photographs is the staff determination to do everything they could to keep their store up and running. It's a true blitz spirit. This is central London, but it was a similar story in bomb-damaged cities up and down the country. Shop staff setting up temporary stores, customers carrying on regardless everyone determined that they wouldn't be beaten by the bombs. John Lewis wasn't the only store on Oxford Street to be destroyed that night. Just here, Selfridges was also hit, badly damaged. 
two other major department stores, now both closed down, were also ablaze that night. One is just here, Peter Robinson, a household name. It's now Nike Town. We're just coming up to the old Bourne and Hollingsworth building, also bombed that night. Another much loved store. And it's now the Plaza. In just one night of the Blitz, all the hard work and dedication of generations was left lying in ruins. By 1940, over one and a half million men had been conscripted, and staff numbers in shops plummeted. Then, in December 1941, the government introduced a measure that would change shop work and change women's lives forever. For the first time in British history, women were conscripted into a war effort. Under the National Service Act, all single women aged between 20 and 30 were liable to be called up. They supported the war effort in all kinds of ways, at sea as wrens, on the land as land girls, and on the factory floor in munitions. But all this left retailers with a big problem. Many of those conscripted were shop girls. So who was going to run the shop floor? The answer, the very young, the old, and above all, married women. Until now, most professions had expected or even forced women to leave their jobs when they got married. But in a time of national need, these conventions were set to change. The Museum of London Docklands in Canary Wharf houses the Sainsbury's archive. It's very revealing about married women being hired and even promoted. Well, this is a remarkable letter and it comes from Mr RJS, that's Robert Sainsbury, one of the directors of the firm. And it's written in 1942 to a Mrs Shepherd, a married woman, and he wants her to apply for a managerial position. So quite remarkable in itself. The whole thing rests on whether women like Mrs Shepherd are mobile. Are they able to move to another branch because of their family commitments? At the end of the letter, he says, we realise that a large proportion of our female staff undertake domestic duties as well as their work with us. He's tying himself in a bit of a knot because he, he wants these women workers to step up. He's not sure if they're able to, given their domestic responsibilities. He's desperate for them to do so. You can just feel this is very uncharted territory. And this is a lovely piece. This is an advert taken out by Sainsbury's in the papers to basically reassure customers that even though women managers are in place, everything's going to be fine. You can still shop there in comfort and it takes the form of a conversation between a male manager and a male customer and they're talking about the men of Sainsbury's going off to war and the manager's saying the girls who take their place very good indeed sir yes they feel they're doing their bit here a good many are housewives themselves and they know all about wartime shopping it's a matter of give and take or as we say grin and share it Professor Penny Summerfield explains just how groundbreaking this move to hire married women really was. Penny, before the war, women tended to leave work when they got married, is that right? Yes, it is. And in some occupations and industries, there was actually a formal marriage bar. So teachers had to leave in most areas when they married. Um, and it was a practice in an awful lot of places. And how did shopkeepers cope with this labour shortage? Well, initially, I think they went for the young school leavers. School leaving age in the 40s was 14. Um, and then, as things got tighter, they went for the older married woman, especially after the state had introduced direction into part-time work. That's such a familiar idea today, and so many women organise their lives in that way. But was this the first time that part-time work had been structured in that way? It was... It was its recognition that was so new. And did shopkeepers take on married women, mothers, willingly or with a heavy heart? 
Well, it was for all employers, it was a new thing. They hadn't liked having older women. They had certainly hadn't liked having mothers. They seemed like much too much trouble. Mm. Employers of all sorts thought that married women would take time off. But by the end of the war, employers, including shopkeepers, were quite pleased with their older married women. Did married women enjoy working in the war? Well, various surveys showed that they really liked two things. One was the money, and the other was the company. The working mothers, what happens to the children? Well, during World War II, the state did actually create wartime nurseries. So hang on, uh, hang on. The, the state sets up ch state-funded childcare in the war to allow married women to work? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Wartime nurseries were open to the children of all working mothers, whatever their line of war work. The problem for many a patriotic young woman eager to do her part in war work is who will look after her children while she is at the factory? That problem is solved by the creche. Mrs. Hare leaves her small daughter in kind and safe hands while she goes to clock in on her job. Wynne Hudson started working in the lighting department at Peter Jones in West London in the middle of the war. She was 30 years old with three children. So would you drop the children off on, at the yeah. nursery or at school before you went to work? Yeah. And pick them up on the way home or did someone, yes. else, pick, did someone yeah. else pick them up? So they were there for the, the whole day? They, yeah. yeah. Did a lot of mothers get into shop work during the war? Yeah. Oh, yes. Mostly because you needed the money. Yes. Army pay it was so small, yeah. really, what you had to manage on. Yeah. I mean, it really became almost impossible. And do you think they picked shop work because it, it fitted in with their time, or what was the attraction? Well, yes, it really the time, and you see, some of them couldn't do the factory work mm. that they had, you know, that was, which so many of them went into. Mm. Was the store mainly run by women during the war? Yeah, there were men managers, mm. but during the war, they were nearly all women managers and the buyers and that. Yeah. And then it gradually changed over to men came. As the men came back? Back. Oh, they had back. the jobs back again? Yeah. And after the war, did they keep those management jobs? No. Right. No. Do you have a sense of how those women felt when they had to give up those jobs after the war? Well, they kept most of uh, those that wanted to, but a lot of them wanted to leave because mm. their husbands had come home or, yeah. you know, a lot of them wanted to leave, but they were still quite a few of us left. You yes, know. Yeah. A lot of people think working mothers are somehow a new thing, but uh, clearly not. No, <laughs> no. So the shop girl had finally grown up. She was now a shop woman and often a multitasking mum. The employers were quick to emphasise that working mothers were only a temporary solution. As soon as the war was over, they'd go straight back to where they belonged, home and family. Now these same women are going back to make a home for their demobilised men. After five years of working to this tune, there's no escaping it. In 1944, the government passed the Reinstatement in Civil Employment Act, allowing ex-servicemen and women the right to return to their old jobs. In Woolworths alone, there were 335 women working as managers. Their jobs would now be under threat. I'm coming to see Paul Seaton, a former manager at Woolworths, to find out what happened to these so-called manageresses when the men returned. Hello, Paul. Nice to meet you. So come in. Thank you. Paul owns the most extensive collection of Woolworths archive in the country. He even has his own pick and mix stall. What happened after the war in Woolworths? Did women keep their jobs? Only a very few managers kept their jobs. 
people in the forces were all promised that they could have their original store back, which was the law. A lot of people who'd been serving in the forces desperately wanted the comfort of going back to the team of people that they'd been working with. How did the directors of Woolworths manage this transition, this return of the men from the war? There was a little worry in the board about how the women were going to feel about right. stepping down from the, um, from the job. And you see in the minutes of the company mm. that they went to quite considerable lengths to try and make sure that everybody was happy, okay. but there was absolutely no evidence of anyone making a fuss, not one letter to the office complaining about it. Mm. So more than 300 of them, without a fuss, mm. just relinquished the job and went back to filling the counters or supervising or working in the office, whatever they'd mm. been doing before. So, Paul, we've talked about the women who did give up their managerial positions during the war. Did any hang on to them? Yes, there were a handful. This is the mugshot book from the company's 50th birthday. You have to go 300 pages in before you find a woman. And this is her? In there, and this is her. That's, That's right. That's amazing. Miss Froome, yeah. who managed the branch at Manor Park. So she was quite a legendary figure. We can also see why she's legendary, because she's in a sea of male faces. This annual report gives a picture of how the company perceives itself. Mm. It shows you how many people work in an average Woolworth store. Um, sort of gives a message to anybody thinking of pursuing a career. So the manager is portrayed as a man. Four, men, four men in suits. Man, yeah. Two more floor men. And then all of the other menial tasks. Mm. Yeah. So people putting stock away in the stockroom. All the staff on the sales floor and even the, the ancillary staff behind the scenes, all portrayed as women. It's really fascinating, isn't it? That picture says it all. By the early 1950s, the British economy was getting back into its stride. The number of female shop assistants had increased by nearly 40% since the 1930s, and women in retail were now three quarters of a million strong. They included a new generation of shop girls. Madeline Jupp was one of them. She started on the shop floor at 18. When did you start working at Bourne and Hollingsworth? The first year I started at Bourne and Hollingsworth is in 1950, and that's the young lady that went to work there. And had you worked in a shop before? I had, yes, in Peter Robinson's in Oxford Circus, which no longer exists. When I first went to Peter Robinson's to work, I had to spend three months not serving a customer. And I had to learn the correct way, you know, to, to sell. What was the key to selling? The key to selling was obviously to uh, make the customer feel that we got a very good stock, a very good choice, and we didn't push them, and we wanted them to go out of the shop feeling as though they want to come back and shop again. Will you show this lady some cardigans, please? Certainly. Yes, it's what colour would you like, though? Have you anything in powder blue? Yes. Because I wanted the customer to return you know, to me, I wouldn't have a job if it wasn't the customer. And then I went to Paul and Hollingsworth. I did become assistant manageress in the restaurant. How was life in the store in the 50s? Well, it was, uh, I mean, they were quite strict in some respects. We always had to be dressed in black. Now, you could wear a white collar or you could wear pearls. We were treated like young ladies and behaved like young ladies. What's this photo? Well, this photo is the staff outing which we had once a year to a seaside resort. And there's all the shop girls in there. It was, uh, was taken in 1951. So that was the first staff outing I went on. Was it a happy place to work? Did the shop girls enjoy it? Oh, yes, we were very happy. We, we talked about women who'd been involved in war work going mm. back to the home. But how about their daughters, you know, the people like you, the new generation coming up? Were they happy to slot back into that old world? Um, not necessarily, no. I think we, we sort of felt there's a big wide world out there and, and uh, we wanted to sort of enjoy it, really, after the uh, worries we had during the war. And there was that freedom now, after five years mm. of peace, to sort of go and explore and, 
and sort of be a modern young lady, really. And, of course, after the war, you had the new look came in, the new fashions, and we were all eager to embrace that. It was a sort of different generation. We left the pre-war years behind. Yes, it was a sort of buoyant time. Everybody was sort of feeling great relief, and, and it was people so nice to each other. So, you know, it was a lovely period, I think, really. Had shop girls' ambitions changed after the war? It wasn't like you possibly pre-war, where a woman got married and that was it sort of thing. She didn't have ambitions to necessarily go on from there, which, of course, our generation did. Mm. That happened a long time ago. We've got it all cleared up now. I found Madeline's story so interesting because it seemed to me to really capture the spirit of the times. On the one hand, she was attracted by the formality and the traditions of a store like Bourne and Hollingsworth with its rules and regulations and its sense of order. And on the other hand, she and her fellow shop girls were really open to change and ready to move with the times. And the times were changing fast. The post-war baby boom created a massive demographic shift, producing record numbers of teenagers. These teenagers were hugely influenced by American culture, particularly in music, fashion and film. And their mothers were gradually getting a taste for another American export, self-service. The UK's self-service experiment had started in a co-op grocery store in Romford during the war, but it didn't really take off for another decade. Co-op opened its first fully self-service store in 1948. Within three years, there were 600 of them. Now, it's the most natural thing in the world today. Come to the supermarket, scan the freestanding shelves, choose what you want. But back then, it was revolutionary. You take something like tea, this would have been blended for you behind the counter. It would have been bagged up and weighed by a shop girl. Here, you just pick it up, help yourself. Same with biscuits. They would have been served from a jar, perhaps from the counter. Here they are, pre-packaged, brightly coloured, straight in. Everything about these stores was custom made for the new self-service. Fluorescent lighting to make sure everything was well lit. Signage so the customers could navigate their way around the store. Freestanding fridges so people could help themselves to fresh produce. Of course, the checkout. Again, not having to wait at a counter. Even the wire basket, so familiar to us today, but it was specially invented for self-service. It's transparent, you could see through it. All your goods were on display. It's meant to stop shoplifting. You're given a wire basket as you go in, and that's to put the groceries in. From then on, the customer's more or less on her own, free to choose whatever she wants. These shelves with the goods on are called gondolas. Nobody seems to know why, and there's an assistant to see that each gondola is kept stocked. Penny, why did self-service take so long to get off the ground in Britain? Uh, I think there were a number of reasons. Um, obviously, food rationing, that it wasn't enough product around to merchandise to get into the shops, just wasn't there. Um, I think there was resistance. I don't think those who shopped, particularly the middle classes, were particularly keen on having to go and do the work themselves. They were used to being looked after. Not used to being served. Used to being served, absolutely, and helped yeah. and guided. I can imagine some, embraced, you know. some people really holding out for the old ways. Well, we know stories of in the early Sainsbury's of um, Ladies going in and throwing their wire baskets at people in disgust <laughs> because they, you know, they wanted the service. So what changed? That whole consumer culture thing that builds in American 20s and 30s underpins this. And we get it in the 50s. And I think we, we're resistant at first, but we, we grab it wholeheartedly. Did it have an edge of glamour because it came from America? I think it had a huge um, edge of glamour. I mean, that whole Americanisation of British culture in the 50s, whether it be Hollywood film, um, pulp novels, supermarkets, mm. all goes together. What did the stores do to win people over to the new practice? The good themselves became very seductive. Mm. Gradually, the idea of the sort of the, the package and the brand on the package comes into being. The colours of the... Hugely bright. bright. Primary Absolutely. Colours. Yeah, it's a very simple psychology 
you know, be bright and visible and people will buy me. Could you say that the packaging is in a way a substitute for the shop girl? The packaging is absolutely the substitute for the shop girl. Uh, what did she do? She, she put things into bags. That's not necessary. It's already packaged. Um, kept it hygienic, so the packaging does that. And it tells you that it's good quality. She would tell you that before. Now the package tells you that as well. So it does it all. Yes, it is the substitute. And a lot of manufacturers were very alert to the fact that, that women consumers no longer have this sort of external advice and, and that some of them brought in sort of fictional characters in the states for example betty crocker was very well known she was the very sensible housewife who knew how to cook and therefore you took advice from her but she's only a brand she's fictional by the 50s girls were leaving school at 15. They were better educated and expected more out of life. Many flocked to London in search of adventure. 500 young women a week were taking their chances in the capital. They often picked up work as shop girls to support themselves. Perhaps there's more money to be made in London. But is this the main reason why they come? We put that question to a number of girls. The first one we asked works in a big shop in Kensington. Her name is Eileen Nixon. Ever since I left school, I wanted to leave home and Birmingham, and I thought that London would be a bigger and happier place, full of entertainment and a bigger variety of life, and more amusement. I've been here since I was 15, and well, I'm very happy. I'm coming to see writer Diana Melly, who moved to London from Essex at the age of 14. As she tried to make it as a model, Diana worked part-time as a shop girl in a traditional haberdashery on Oxford Street called Jack's. It was a small shop next door to the tube station, Oxford Circus tube station, and it was on four floors. And to begin with, I worked on the ground floor where they sold haberdashery, stockings, gloves. And then I was moved down to the basement where we sold dresses. I made friends with the woman who was the window dresser, a woman, she was also, I think she was 15 or 16. Um, and she was the sort of most bohemian one. She was allowed to wear trousers. Once a week when the new stock came in, one of us would be chosen to go up and try on the sweaters. Uh, and we would be stood on the table and the owner would then run his hands up our legs. Oh. I wasn't often chosen. The, the window dresser was more likely to be chosen because she had rather bigger tits. I think every girl's ambition, if they were as flat-chested as me, was to have a blow-up bra. <laughs> I don't think they exist anymore either. <laughs> and did she just know she had to put up with that? Yeah, one had to put up with it because um, it wasn't, somehow wasn't that easy to get a job. Mm. And if you objected, you'd have got the sack. And the window displays were extraordinary in those days because what you weren't allowed to see in the window was a naked plastic model, you know, with her breasts <laughs> and everything. And um, so when she was dressing the window, she had to do it after the shop was closed and the, and the blinds were down because you couldn't have these naked models in the window. Did you enjoy working there? No, I didn't. Um, I, I'd, I'd had ambitions to be, <laughs> to, be, to be a model, not just, just a shop girl. Yeah. And I was always sort of posing and trying um, and walking into places like Hardy Amy's, you know, never got past the receptionist. <laughs> this, is, this is me, aged um, 14, nearly, nearly 15. Because in those days, you actually had to look 30 and sophisticated. There wasn't really a teenage look, was there? No, that was, that was the look that you aimed at. Yes. When Diana was offered the chance to work for a new hip boutique, she went for it. The boutique was called Bazaar, started by designer Mary Quant. Bazaar broke the mold. Quant created not just a new youth look, but helped kickstart a new youth culture. She designed her own clothes and made sure that she hired shop girls who looked great wearing them. 
Bazaar was on the King's Road, in what is now a coffee shop. So is it this part here? Yes, yeah, that's right. And yes, and it was all just one window with these fabulous looking models, not real models, um, in, in Mary's clothes, which was so different to anything we'd seen before. Goodness. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing here to prompt the memory. And I have a sort of feeling of lounging around in that area. Apparently, I was usually weeping. Oh, really? <laughs> what about? Some, somebody said once, I remember Diana when she worked at Bazaar, she was always weeping about some <laughs> bloke. <laughs> When did you work at Bazaar? 1958. I'd lost my Essex accent um, because the customers who came to Bazaar were quite different from, from the Jack's customers. They were richer and um, maybe kind of more bohemian, but, but posh, posh bohemia. Um, and I think that Mary Quant wanted the sort of women working in the shop who would have not been totally out of sync with the customers. Yeah. And what made it so special, would you say? Before that, all the clothes were seen to be for 50-year-olds, um, let alone teenagers or 20-year-olds. I mean, it was just completely different. What was it like at the time? What kind of reputation did it have? Well, you certainly knew that if you came to work in Bazaar, you weren't going to be a shop girl. <laughs> What were you going to be? Well, I'm thinking about that. You were going to be someone who worked at Bazaar. <laughs> Something quite different. Yeah. It was fun. It was kind of a feather in your cap to work at Bazaar. The King's Road was the place to be. And Bazaar was, um, was where it was at. By the mid-1960s, London had over 80 boutiques. It was enough to fill a small guidebook like this one. It's packed full of fascinating things like little maps to show you exactly where to find these places in back streets and back alleys and how much money you should expect to spend when you get there. And of course, magazines went to town on boutiques. Lots and lots of features, interviews with owners, that kind of thing. I've got one here from Rave magazine, which was a pop magazine of the time, which explains this kind of new phenomenon of boutiques. They are the current in places to buy clothes and accessories. People who run them with flair and fashion sense know exactly what you like to wear and how it should be worn. Boutiques are small, interesting, friendly places where you can browse for hours without anyone bothering you. And it goes on to say the boutique boom is extending fast across the whole country. Most shop girls still worked in traditional independent shops and the ever-growing chain stores. But for a lucky few working in boutiques, being a shop girl was more than just a job. It was a status symbol. Particularly if that boutique was Bieber. Bieber started in the early 1960s as a mail order company run from Barbara Hulanicki's home. A decade on and three shops later, it moved here to a seven-storey former department store in central London. And this was its roof garden. The roof garden, with its famous flamingos, was the pinnacle of Barbara Hulanicki's vision for Bieber. Over a decade, she and her husband, Fitz, had expanded their original budget boutique into an enormous lifestyle store, selling everything from fashion, food, to children's wear. Shop girls were crucial to Bieber's success. They modelled the clothes, they hung out with the customers, and lived by Fitz's one golden rule. Never, ever sell hard. The whole idea is that we are not trying to sell anything to anybody. We are merely putting things into the store in the hope that somebody will come along and buy them. 
we do not want to be seen to be pushing the customer into anything. One rule is if anyone ever says, can I help you, they sack that second. Fitz was rather more laid back in dealing with his staff's shaky knowledge of their stock. OK. Are they, mm, yeah. So the short ones aren't going? No? Well, sort of. What do you mean, sort of? Well, I mean, like, there's a lot out there, but some are sold as well. Yeah? It doesn't make much difference. What? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Only too clearly. <laughs> Delicia Price, seen on the right, started working at Bieber when she was 20. Also, I think we ought to make a list of all the colours that are running low. Yes. yes. Today, she's coming back to the roof garden to tell me what it was like. <laughs> Hi. Mm. Great. This is amazing. Isn't it beautiful? Oh. It's wonderful, yeah. isn't it? It's so lovely to be back here again. How much would you say that shop girls made Bieber what it was? Um, well, I think they were incredibly important because they were on the front line, really. You know, they were absolutely vital. They, yes. were, they were there all the time. They had incredible influence. Both Barbara and Fitz were incredibly... I mean, they knew everybody, even up until this place where there was hundreds of people working here. They both were incredibly involved and were very, very respectful and listened to them and treated them as intelligent people, which they were. Yes. And there were all kinds of stuff. They were very posh girls, very working-class girls, a huge spectrum. Is it right that, that part of the role of the Bieber girl was to, to befriend the customer? Well, not, not exactly befriend them, but to... to, to be a, almost like a role model for them. Well, we were a, a role model. Yeah, or, a mu or a muse. Or... We were, we, yeah, we were, we were kind of with the customer. We were just girls. And the people who came in were girls. There weren't any rules and regulations. You know, you, you could talk, I mean, we spent hours talking to people. People used to come in and fall asleep or uh, bring their dogs or, yes. you know. <laughs> so it really was a place to be and a place to oh, hang out. It was amazing. It was a really dark version of a sort of Arab tent. It was wonderful. I mean, everybody used to come in. Mick Jaggy used to come in and sit on the counter and chat to Fitz and stuff like that. And so talk me through the different roles you had here. <laughs> well, I started off in the shop. Then they kept wanting a size 10 to do fittings on, because Barbara's incredible perfectionist and the clothes had to be fitted. And then one day she grabbed me and she said, you look right, and she took me to the office and they measured me and they said I was an absolutely perfect size. Barbara Hulanicki expected her shop girls to model her clothes. Delicia was one of those that particularly embodied the Bieber brand. Del, can you put the jacket on again? The shape that I think is terrific is very tall and square-shouldered and a bit flat-chested. Unfortunately, there aren't many people like that around, but if you start off building on somebody like that, your clothes will look like that even on chubby people. If you want to look our glass shape, you just don't buy our clothes. How would you capture the spirit of Bieber for, say, you know, the new generation? Um, it was just um, the new generation coming into its own, really. Delicia's generation of shop girls enjoyed more freedom than assistants had ever had before. In the 1880s, shop girls at Whiteley's were forced to follow 176 strict rules. In the 1970s at Bieber, they abided by one rule only, don't hassle the customer. But critics of laid-back boutique culture claimed it allowed owners to take advantage of their staff. Spare Rib, a new feminist magazine of the time, warned that shop girls were being exploited. Some of the feminists were very critical of the conditions of work in shops. And Rosie Boycott, who was the editor of Spare Rib, did write a critique of the working conditions of young women who worked in, in the boutiques. She exposed, you know, long hours and low pay and being sort of bossed about by employers and so on, and did come up with some pretty depressing Just statistics. Just looking at the headline on this. Yes. And be with the trendsetters. If you're a super girl looking for an exciting, well-paid job, apply today. <laughs> and this is what you'll be landed with. 
rather burst the bubble of the boutiques. Isn't it? Yes. <laughs> the harsh reality. Working in the trendy boutiques is boring, badly paid and hard work. The boutique owners manage to exploit the market by claiming to offer exciting jobs, groovy music, interesting people, cheaper clothes. It all adds up to the ideal job for the Kensington girl who doesn't want to sit bashing at a typewriter all day but prefers the idea of being in a boutique. Is that, is that a bit harsh? I think she's uh, being honest about the working conditions mm. and the pay and that was a preoccupation of women's liberation pay of nine or ten or twenty even fifteen or twenty pounds a week in the mid by the mid 70s was a reasonable wage for a short time mm. what it didn't offer you was anywhere else to go right. you know and of course the hours were long it was exhausting you had to look gorgeous but was that one of the problems with boutiques that the girls had to look gorgeous yes but don't forget most young girls do want to look gorgeous <laughs> But with the economic turmoil of the 1970s, many boutiques struggled to survive. Chain stores, though, were growing in size and number and squeezed out smaller shops of all types. Then came the mall. This is Brent Cross Shopping Centre in the northwest suburbs of London. It was built on an old dog track and some allotment plots. When it opened in 1976, Britain had never seen anything like it. It was our first standalone out of town shopping mall. It covered an immense 800,000 square feet, spread over 52 acres, and employed over 4,000 people. Once inside, the atmosphere of soft lights, marbled floors, and fountains might lull you into thinking you were in a five star hotel. The organisers quite deliberately set out to achieve an upmarket atmosphere to sell their quality goods. I had not seen anything like this before. Do you, do you think you'll like it to shop in there? Very good. I've just been in Marks. It's very, very nice. And it'll save us all the journey up the West End. I think it's one of the best precincts and shopping centres I've been in. Must have cost a lot of money. Oh, yes, it certainly yes. must have cost a lot of money. <laughs> but it's well worth it. Understandably, the shopkeepers and assistants working in the shadow of Brent Cross were nervous of their new supersized neighbour. It's very telling that the local traders of the area couldn't count on the support of their own local MP, one Margaret Thatcher. Instead, she embraced Brent Cross and its enterprising spirit. Quite ironic, given that she was arguably Britain's most famous shop girl. For the first 18 years of my life, I lived over the shop which my father owned and ran, and knew full well the tremendous number of hours which went into earning your keep. I grew up in Essex in the 80s, heartland of Thatcherism. I was no fan of her policies, but I was fascinated by her as a woman, as a character, as a politician. Coming to her hometown, Grantham. So here it is, the shop where Margaret Thatcher grew up. She was born here in the mid-1920s, a time when the number of British shops peaks at a million. Many of them like this back then, small family businesses, the Roberts Grocer's Store. Now it's living health, more of a lifestyle store. So this is the young Margaret's bedroom, right at the top of the house. It's now a treatment room. It's very small, very humble. It's the view from her window. Very grand, double-fronted house opposite, green fields in the distance, but right between them, two massive supermarkets. These giant superstores seem the polar opposite of Margaret Thatcher's cosy family shop. Today, there are just a third of the number of stores there were when she lived above the Grantham Grocers. And despite her being the town's most famous daughter, there's very little to mark her life here. Although there is a rather curious memorial to her in the local library and museum. 
This is Grantham's greatest tribute to Margaret Thatcher. It's her childhood bed. Surely got to be one of the stranger ways of marking the life of any former Prime Minister, but it's a curiously intimate one. I do wonder what the effect was of that life in the shop, in that room, on the young Margaret and on her later politics. You get some sense of it from her autobiography. Life over the shop is much more than a phrase. It is something which those who have lived it know to be quite distinctive. For one thing, you are always on duty. People would knock at the door at almost any hour of the night or weekend if they ran out of bacon, sugar, butter or eggs. Everybody knew that we lived by serving the customer. It was pointless to complain, so nobody did. I just think that's so revealing. Obviously, lots of things shaped her politics, but those early years in the shop taught her that the power lay with the customer. She believed in the right to buy, in the broadest sense, that the customer should have what they wanted, when they wanted it. And this is what many customers wanted. Larger stores with lower prices, longer trading hours, and more car parking all made possible by the loosening of employment and planning laws, hallmarks of Thatcherism. My own hometown became a classic example of the modern-day shopping experience. As teenagers, my friends and I spent a lot of time hanging out here on South End High Street. We also worked here in its many chain stores, M&S, Next, Topshop, Miss Selfridge, WH Smiths. And I worked round the corner in Sainsbury's. Big chains like Sainsbury's have seen a massive increase in their market share since I worked here. Today, we spend much more than we used to, but in a much smaller number of larger stores. Plus, we splash out increasing amounts online. I was here in the late 80s when this store opened. I used to work on these checkouts. First time any of us had seen barcodes and scanners, and we all had to be especially trained. I remember there was a prize for scanner of the week for the person who could scan the most goods in the shortest time. <laughs> Don't think I ever won that. Today, retail workers are still the largest group of private sector workers in the country. Almost two thirds of them are women, and over half of them work part time. Yeah. Vanessa, how long have you worked here? Just over 24 years. So. I'll 24 and a half years. That's a long time. Yeah. And you've stayed here that long, I so, have. yeah. On and off. So when you say on and off, it's between children. Yes, of course. How about you, Jeanette? How long have you worked here? I've worked here 16 years, took four years there, and I've been back eight years. Oh. And when you took four out, was that...? With Looking after my mum. Yeah. 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 Did you think flexibility is a big part of the attraction of working here? Definitely. Right. Definitely, because yeah. yeah. it helps out when you've got family. You right. can do things around their school and everything. It was the main reason for me. I mean, do you think that's why a lot of people work in the big stores like this? I do, yeah, because there's so many of us. They've got that bit more flexibility. And how do you think shopping's changing today? Um, it's massively changed, mm. in, in, you know, in terms of online shopping now. It's a huge business, yeah. absolutely huge business. Of the clothing as well, you know, one and of the biggest clothing retailers. People don't have to shop now. You could, if you wanted to, sit at home and buy everything, yeah. almost yeah. everything online. So why do people still come to the shops? Yeah, because they miss, mm. like, the it's chat. Right. Well, unlike, mm. you know, the company. Some people are on their own. They come out seven and sit outside the shop waiting, waiting for it to open. Mm, yeah. Same yeah. faces yeah. every day yeah. because they want to talk. What about the downsides of shop work? The, the pressure. Yeah, there's, there's a fair amount of pressure. Uh, to perform, to, to do well, and also the stigma that goes with it, the, the people that look down on you. Um, and it, sometimes it can be really obvious. Um, Why is it obvious? The, um, just by the way they look at you or they ex what they expect. Mm. But you, you sort of shine through that. You sort of have to go one step above yeah. that. There is a stigma attached to, oh, well, someone just works in a shop. Yeah. Um, they haven't done very well for themselves, whereas if you mm. was an accountant or something, they think that you're highly educated. But that's not the... Obviously, there is people no, that yeah. are highly educated. They've been here, they've gone to uni, mm. they've come back and they've gone straight into a management role because yeah. they've got a degree. So what do you like about working here? I love the customers. I do. I know it sounds a bit cranky, but I do. We have <laughs> such a laugh. It's really good fun. We all sort of help each other out, don't we? I really like it. 
a lot of people might think that shop workers don't have a relationship with, so oh, no, much with customers. Oh, no, you do. You really yeah. do. Definitely. You've got your regulars and they look Definitely. out for you. Even if you're just sitting on a checkout, they'll rather queue and come to a specific person because they're going for a relationship and it's really good fun. And the joy you get yeah. when you've, you've served someone and you've, you've put all your knowledge in place and then your manager might come down the next day or a week and say, actually, someone come down and said they were really happy with your service yeah. and then you think, yes. You know, and that's, yeah. that's how it makes you feel. Yeah. <laughs> Shops are part of our ordinary, everyday lives. But if you take a step back, the story of the women who work in them is extraordinary. Our shop girls have been at the forefront of waves of social change, from Victorian apprentices to boutique entrepreneurs, from the first generation of female graduate trainees to the first generation of officially recognised working mums. Over the past 150 years, shop girls have performed as servants, specialists, advisors, models, muses and much else. But what does the future hold for them? In fashion boutique Start in London's East End, the assistants are trialling cutting-edge technology. Online customers browse a virtual store, yet can still call on the help of real-life in-store staff. If you're not able to come to our store in person, then you can, from, where, from your desktop, you can um, take a virtual tour around the store, uh, focus in on uh, a particular object that catches your eye, uh, and then email us um, or text us what, any questions you have. So we still have a personal interaction with the customer, um, even though you could be thousands of miles away on the other side of the world. Through instant messaging, the assistant can send the customer all the information they need. These assistants need to be tech savvy, fashion savvy, and customer savvy. We are the next generation of shop girls. They basically allow us to extend our role further from the shop floor. So we are able to give the same um, personal service, expert advice to customers all over the world, not just the ones who are able to make it into the shop. So I think it's just the next step for us, really. It's clear that in the years ahead, shops and shopping are set to change. Women workers have done so much to shape the way we've shopped in the past. But will stores be able to count on them in the future? That's partly up to us and what we want as consumers. But it's also up to women and what they want from life. Coming up tomorrow, journey's end for the Coast team, concluding their trip to Australia on the Coral Coast and in Shark Bay, 9 o'clock tomorrow. Next tonight, more stars than you can shake the proverbial stick at on the best of the Sarah Millican television programme.